Thank you, everyone, for joining us for the Sustainable Forest Education Cooperative uh, and the University of Minnesota Extension Forestry webinars. Uh, we're really pleased today to have uh, Dr. Brian Akuma with the Department of Entomology um, at the University of Minnesota to talk today about eastern larch beetle and the problems that it's uh, doing in northern Minnesota. Uh, Brian's an associate professor in entomology uh, and also a McKnight land grant professor. Um, and so with that, um, I'll turn it over to Brian. For those of you watching us online, uh, just a reminder, um, if you have questions at any point uh, throughout the webinar, enter them into the chat box. Uh, that's on the lower right side um, of the WebEx system. And we'll be feeding questions to Brian back and forth um, throughout the webinar. Um, and other things you can maximize and minimize uh, the webcam view of Brian if you want, or to maximize the, um, the slides that Brian is sharing. Um, so those are all uh, available. Um, and so with that, I'll turn things over to Brian. Thank you, Matt. And thank you to the people assembled in this room. Nice to be here. Matt has asked me to talk a little bit about climate change in eastern large beetle um, and trouble for, for Tamarack. And, um, you know, Stepping back a little bit, often when we think of, you know, global change, and especially this week with Catherine Hayhoe coming on campus uh, from Texas Tech, she's giving a number of lectures about climate change, global change, um, large-scale issues. And sometimes I have trouble trying to figure out where does Minnesota fit? Where does my day-to-day -day life fit in the context of global change? Um, you know, we could, we could go to talks and see pictures of polar bears clinging to icebergs that are melting, and, and these things capture us right away. Um, very easy to relate to from a, you know, oh, no, the, the, the ice is melting. We, we see climate change in action. Um, when we start to think about global change in forest insects in Minnesota, I think the examples are there if we look for them. Um, two aspects of global change that my lab works on are invasive species and climate change. Uh, invasive species and climate change being kind of the, the two big carbingers of global change. Um, we're all familiar, I think, in the state with the invasion uh, of emerald ash borer. And, uh, you know, as it continues and, and will continue to kill ash tree through, uh, throughout the state. Um, that's invasion biology of emerald ash borer, perhaps a little bit less studied is the invasion biology of gypsy moth. Um, and this is getting a lot of attention right now. Um, if you look at Minnesota, right now we have gypsy moth that is firmly established and entrenched as the invasion continues to spread westward from the east of the United States. And we now have gypsy moth up in the Arrowhead region of the state, and it's entrenched down here in the southwestern, southeastern portion of the state as well. And the Minnesota Department of Agriculture is implementing treatments for gypsy moth uh, this coming spring. And, you know, it's, it's kind of an interesting uh, topic looking at the invasion of gypsy moth, um, especially in the Arrowhead region of Minnesota, because if you look at the climate modeling, um, from 10 years ago, from David Gray, and, uh, and I've worked with David, um, really like his work a lot. Um, some of the early projections showed quite clearly that gypsy moth is never going to make a go of it in northern Minnesota. It's just climatically unsuitable. Um, the, uh, it, it's going to be you know, either too cold that their development is going to be prolonged, or with the overwintering mortality of egg masses, We'll see substantial mortality, and it just it won't do very much. And instead, um, last week, I was up in Ely speaking to the people at Ely about some of the proposed treatments that the MDA is looking at with aerial sprays of BTK, um, because we have gypsy moth in northern Minnesota, and it's been there for 10 years now. Um, and it looks like it's persisting because of the snow cover, that any egg masses under the snow are being insulated, and that's allowing the moth populations to... Um, persist and move. Um, perhaps another example of global change in forest insects in Minnesota is the risk of invasion of mountain pine beetle. Um, we have really good scientific evidence that warming winters here in western Canada allowed the historic range of mountain pine beetle to climb northward since 1950, 1960, until we ended up with a situation where mountain pine beetle got far enough north and into lodgepole pine 
in high enough numbers that they actually were blown over the Rocky Mountains into the eastern foothills here into Alberta where lodgepole and jack pine hybridize. And now that mountain pine beetles into pure jack pine of the Canadian boreal forest, it is moving through this boreal corridor um, coming towards Minnesota. And of course, we're concerned about the risk of introductions from states with western populations of mountain pine beetle. And my lab is doing some work on that as well. In example four, we have eastern larch beetle. And I might put with this a big question mark because eastern larch beetle to me has never been a candidate for questions of invasive species or climate change. I don't think it's been a, a, a topic of concern really to very many people at all. Um, and you know, eastern larch beetle as an insect has been studied for more than 100 years. Um, this is Mr. J.M. Swain, Dominion Forester, assistant to the Deputy Minister of Forestry in Canada, 1911. He was a pioneer. He wrote the first book on bark beetles. Um, he wrote a practical guide to bark beetles and their management, compiled all the biology of 100 different species, how to manage them. This was standard forestry curriculum in Canada. Um, around the turn of the 20th century. And I looked up his book, and the section on eastern larch beetles is very short um, because they're not a problem. They've never been a problem. Um, it's just eastern larch beetle is what it is. And I can summarize uh, the early writings of J.M. Swain uh, quite easily. Um, I go through what we know about eastern larch beetles. So they are bark beetles. They tunnel through the bark, and they get into the tree, and they mate, and they lay some eggs, and they just kind of do what bark beetles do. Um, they're, uh, they're small. They're not exceptionally photogenic if you're not a forest entomologist, I suppose. Um, you know, we always talk about mountain pine beetle. Mountain pine beetle is in the same genus as eastern larch beetle, and the popular media has picked up on this term of phrase that they're the size of mouse turds. And so anytime now you're talking to the public about bark beetles, you can say, oh, yes, they're the size of mouse turds. And oh, yes, I knew that already. Yes. <laughs> ah, very good. Um, Eastern larch beetles, oh, they're small, they're black. They, they, they look like mouse poops if you just, you know, just glance at them sideways. Um, I wish I could tell you something exciting like they're the next invasive problem, but they're not. They're native. They're native insects. Um, They've been with us for centuries. They will be with us for centuries. Um, they're, just, they're just a native insect. Uh, because they're bark beetles, they're boring. They tunnel through the bark. Um, eastern larch beetles, as eastern larch beetles go, they're relatively harmless. They don't usually kill trees, as far as we know. And Swain even cut off the entire management section of his, his paragraphs on eastern larch beetles. It's like management. Nothing to report because they don't need to be managed. Okay. Um, even go to the latest forest insect, insect and disease leaflet from the Forest Service uh, from 10 years ago. Uh, some of that work coming out of the University of Minnesota, Steve Seibold, Steve Kotovich with the Forest Service. Uh, silvicultural recommendations for tamarack affected by eastern large beetle. There are none. Um, just kind of this big knowledge gap because we haven't really needed the knowledge up to this point. Um, we do know they live inside tamaracks. Can't even talk about, you know, something like gypsy moth that feeds on more than 300 species of trees and shrubs. Eastern large beetle, tamarack, what you see is what you get. And, uh, you know, in summary, um, nobody can really fit out 50, 45 minutes talking about these things. Um, and so that's about all I have, I think, if you had asked me to give this talk a few years ago. Um, so I could talk a little bit about tamarack. So we'll, we'll talk about larynx. Um, range of eastern tamarack, I'm sure as many of you know, it's found coast to coast, Canada and the United States. Um, important peat and boreal uh, conifer. Um, and the range of eastern larch beetle, it tracks really well with tamarack. Wherever you find tamarack, you can find eastern larch beetles. Two peas in a pod. They love each other. Um, they've coexisted for years and years and years. Um, 
Uh, right about now, spring, um, I love seeing all the needles flush. Uh, tamarack is probably our favorite deciduous conifer. You can see the needles flushing right about now, those green tips coming out. Um, very important uh, in bog peatland ecosystems. In the fall, the characteristic uh, yellow color, which really adds to fall before the needles fall. It's, it's such a beautiful tree. I really, really love tamarack. It's one of my favorite trees. And eastern larch beetles, of course, like it too. Um, uh, it doesn't have huge economic um, use as a tree. I think that's fair to say. Um, culturally, it's kind of interesting to look at how tamarack has been used through the years. Uh, the First Nations peoples use it extensively. Tamarack as a word it actually comes from the Algonquin Indian uh, snowshoe word, uh, akamantak. And it's, it's, if, you, if you read some of the etymology of this, um, it, there are some questions whether it's snowshoe wood or supple wood, but uh, either one works. Um, it's a very, very strong wood. The root flares of the trees um, are often used in shipbuilding and still extensively used in shipbuilding, in ships' knees, and to buttress the foundation of the decks. Um, you can still find, uh, you know, if you go on do-it-yourself, uh, you know, survival websites and things like that, um, tamarack is uh, frequently used for things like sled runners. Um, you can steam it, you can bend it very strong, holds up very well, very rot resistant. Um, uh, I grew up on a farm, works great for fence posts. Um, very rot resistant, so it does get you know significant use, but uh, not not a hugely important economic species in our landscape. Um, I, I thought it was interesting that tamarack comes from you know Akamantak snowshoe wood. I looked up the etymology of eastern larch beetle and its scientific name, and it's Dendrochronus simplex. It's a Dendrochronus bark beetle, and simplex is just simple and plain. <laughs> Our friendly beetle, the Easter Larch beetle, so simple, so plain. There is nothing much more to say about it. Um, that's just how it was named and how it shall remain. Um, and so that's, that's kind of it. Um, we, we do know from Swain's early work that uh, outbreaks are very, very rare. Rarely do Easter Larch beetles kill trees. Um, but, you know, there are some rules that beetles will attack trees when the trees are stressed. And so if you can avoid or alleviate that stress, typically the trees will not be uh, attacked. Um, you can find it, you know, here in Minnesota, this is a, a picture of Mike and Janet Albers and myself going for a walk on a beautiful spring day, um, looking for eastern larch beetles. And you can see here, you know, some spring flooding, perhaps some mechanical damage from road construction. And, yeah. If, uh, if you gash a tree, eastern larch beetles will find it, and uh, they'll, they'll finish off the tree um, as necessary. Um, if you have you know, residual trees left after logging, if they're nicked up, uh, some of this residual matter here, if uh, there's still sufficient moisture in it, they'll get into the down stuff, colonize that. Uh, they can build up decent populations, occasionally spill over and kill some green trees, but they should subside in here too. Um, wind throw events, if you have, uh, you know, wind throw, if you remove some forest cover around the tamarack, open up that stand, get some wind throw, trees toppling over, eastern larch beetles will find that in the spring, colonize the trees. Um, chainsaws typically are a little bit hard on trees. Eastern larch beetles are pretty good at tracking those. Um, cone gathering operations, um, you can expect eastern larch beetle to to fill up the bowl here and emerge and perhaps try some attacks on some live trees, but they may or may not be successful and things will die down after a little while. Um, tamarack has been a, uh, a very important component of Minnesota's forest cover for quite some time. Uh, this is a map from Sue Crocker and Greg Lickness, uh, FIA collaborators. Um, showing tamarack basal area, you can see how much north is in the northern part of the state, um, in through the lakes area, Red Lake management area, um, and creeping up to the arrowhead. We have 10% forest cover in tamarack, and it continues to be decimated by eastern larch beetle. Um, 
Mark Roberts with the Forest Service shared some of these photos with me shortly after I came. I've been at the University of Minnesota now for five, six years, and uh, I was shocked to see pictures like this. Um, this, to me, looked like eastern large beetle's aggressive kissing cousin, southern pine beetle, from the southern states. And you could, you could see this wave front expanding through the forest. Um, this looks like southern pine beetle. Um, you know, if there's a few more little pock marks here and there, you might say, oh, it's maybe mountain pine beetle or spruce beetle or something like that. But um, pictures like this from eastern large beetle are really, really, really unusual. Um, they do occur, um, again, after, you know, significant region-wide disturbances. But to see this in Minnesota, I was kind of surprised. Um, when, uh, when I arrived and I talked to our friends at the DNR and I said, you know, what are your most significant forest health issues uh, from an insect standpoint that you think the University of Minnesota could lend a hand with? They said, you know, instead, I was expecting emerald ash borer, gypsy moth. Uh, instead, they said, eastern large beetle. And I was like, really? Are they just trying to test the new guy? Like, um, Eastern large field is not usually a problem. And then I saw pictures like this. I was like, wow, this is stunning. Uh, this is very exciting. Um, and you can see here that tamarack forest type affected by Eastern large beetles since 2000. Uh, we keep rattling around here, you know, five of the last six years, 30,000 30, acres or more. And this is highly unusual. If you look, I mean, we did not have any outbreaks of Eastern large beetle known in North America before 1970. And even some of the region-wide ones that we saw in the Maritimes, in Alaska, um, through the 70s and 80s, typically you would have five or six years of tree killing activity, and then populations would return to zero. Nothing more going on. And so to see this here in Minnesota uh, is just stunning to me. This is like, whoa, something very unusual is happening here. Um, this is current data as of last week from our friend Brian Schwingel at the DNR. Brian is here in the room today. I did not ask him this morning whether this graph was current because Brian has been doing a lot of work trying to make sure that the aerial survey data is the best quality it can be. And every time I ask him, he changes one of these bars just by a little bit. So I said, I'm not asking Brian this morning. I'm just going with this graph. Is this okay, Brian? Is this Okay, correct. I'm getting the thumbs up. Uh, this, is, this is acceptable. He has not changed any of these bars today. Uh, so, take home message. Uh, current cumulative mortality estimate um, is about 295,000 acres, or about 29% of the state's tamarack. And Matt Russell and I are baseball fans. And there's this really prestigious club in baseball called the 30-30 Club. If you're a professional baseball player, you could hit 30 home runs and steal 30 bases. And I'm looking at these numbers, and I'm going, wow, Eastern Large Beetle is really close to joining the 300,000 30 club. Um, acres of mortality and percentage of state forest cover. Um, but, you know, really, it's not a great place to be. Uh, a little side note, um, like I mentioned, there have been a couple of smaller well, I won't say necessarily smaller, but shorter-lived outbreaks um, throughout the range of tamarack. If you look at Alaska and the Maritimes and uh, in the 1970s, 1980s, um, and those were often the effect of defoliating insects, insects like spruce budworm, large bud moth, um, that feed on the needles, really stress the tamarack, and then eastern larch beetle can come in and colonize the tamarack and kill them. Um, we have some defoliators that could be potentially important in Minnesota, uh, like large sawfly. Um, we haven't seen huge populations of large sawfly that would easily explain how we have a 15-year and continuing outbreak of eastern large beetle. Um, we are seeing a lot of large case bear on the landscape. Uh, we have two students right now, Ali Gebauer and Sam Farner, who are looking, working on uh, different aspects of large case bear, trying to figure out why this little tiny insect has been uh, popping up. This is a little tiny, tiny invasive moth. Um, it was introduced 
turn of last century, spread rapidly across the United States, uh, became a big problem in Larch, Western Larch as well. Um, and there was a large biological control program that was put together, and they found a couple of candidate parasitic wasps, released them, and in Minnesota, um, we think that the parasitic wasps were released around you know, 1960, 1970. Nobody's quite sure. What we do know is large case bearer populations crashed, and they just disappeared. And large case bearer has not been part of any story to speak of um, up until the last 10 or 15 years. And we're not quite sure whether biological control has all of a sudden failed. We're not quite sure if a change in climate has changed something in the synchrony with this insect and with the trees and when they're flushing needles. Um, this insect, it spends the winter in a little case here. This is a hollowed out tamarack needle here, large needle, and a little tiny caterpillar that lives inside in the spring now. They're just getting ready to reactivate, and they're kind of interesting. They'll, they'll hang out in this case, and then they'll crawl out as far as they can without losing the attachment and munch on the needle this way, and then they'll crawl back this way and munch on the needles and then retract themselves back in the case. And they carry their house around with them. And that's why in bad years you'll see the foliage right after it leaps out kind of take on that singed or burnt appearance. And that's case bear. Um, so we are seeing high populations of case bear. Um, I was talking, Ali is here in the room with us today, um, who's working on biological control of this insect. And she was saying to me, uh, she's selecting some field sites for this summer, um, that it's almost harder at this point to find a tamarack tree without case bear than it is to find one with. Um, they just seem to be all over the place. But we haven't seen the large scale defoliation that would easily explain eastern larch beetles. So we don't think that defoliation from these insects is completely responsible either. When I talk to colleagues, forest entomologists in neighboring provinces and states, I'm, uh, I'm seeing that eastern larch beetle is actually quite active. And there are strong populations right now that are going through province of Quebec, province of Manitoba, Ontario, our northern neighbors, um, Michigan, Wisconsin, um, a lot of, of tamarack there. And when you start to see something that widespread, and it's not just confined to a local area, you start to think, well, this probably isn't just something like a water deficit drought. Um, We were kind of fortunate in what some of our studies showed us and how easy some of these links look to be made. I'll share some of this data with you now. Um, Fraser, uh, he's graduated. He's now working with the Canadian government on spread control of mountain pine beetle in the boreal forest of Canada as it comes towards Minnesota. So it's kind of neat to see him go from Minnesota to protecting the state um, a little bit farther north. Okay. So here is the, east, the life cycle of eastern larch beetle. Um, and this is what we know from the textbooks. Um, reproductive parent adults, so they overwinter um, right around the base of the tree. They come out in early May. So in a few weeks, we'll see the adults come crawling out of the leaf litter and the duff. And uh, oh, they'll emerge for the winter, and they'll take off, and they'll fly, and they'll select some tamaracks, and they'll tunnel through the bark and start laying some eggs. And from mid-May to mid-July, you'll see lots of trees being attacked, lots of eggs laid. Those eggs will hatch by mid-June, right through mid-August. These egg, eggs turn into little grubs that are tunneling underneath the bark, uh, basically girdling the tree inside. And those larvae should get to pupation stage by late summer. And after a couple of weeks of pupating underneath the bark, they will turn into adults. 
And this is kind of a, an interesting adult stage here. Um, we, we've always thought they're non-reproductive root adults. Um, anything that turns into an adult by the end of the summer typically don't have flight muscles. They can't fly. Um, previous researchers have taken these into the lab, dissected them, see what they're made of. Uh, they can't fly. They come out of the tree, ah, I can't fly, I'll walk. They walk straight to the base of the tree, toddle into the leaf litter, and get ready to spend the winter. Some of the ones that are too lazy don't even bother leaving the tree. They just stay in the tree as these non-emergent beetles, and they spend the winter, right, basically on that same tree, um, either at the base or inside the tree, and they'll go through the winter, and once you get into the spring, early May, three, four weeks from now, that's when you'll see the eastern larch beetles emerge from the trees and start the cycle all over again. Now, there are, in the literature, if you read the textbooks, it refers to things called three different broods. So here's the parent generation that comes out first thing in the spring, and we see that they immediately will select a first cohort of trees. Um, these things come out in a very, very well worked out temperature relationship. When it gets warm enough, they all come out, they swarm, they attack the trees. If you're a bark beetle, you're the size of a mouse turd. Trees are much larger. You need numbers to be able to successfully get into a tree. So thousands of these things will congregate on the trees, all tunnel through, try to get inside. Um, it's a, a, literally a life and death struggle for the tree. Um, often, you know, if, it, if they're not successful on live trees, and eastern larch beetles usually aren't, um, they'll get into slash and, and other stressed trees. Females will lay their eggs. When that tree is full, the female might decide that, ah, oh, I am not done. I still have some eggs. I must go lay them. So she will leave the tree, and she will fly off and find another set of trees. And if this whole process here for the first brood is happening at the same time, a week later, they're all done, the trees are full, you'll get the second peak of trees a couple weeks after the first. And it's the females getting rid of their unspent eggs. They're egg dumping, getting into trees. Not as nearly as, as large of an attack as the first one. And there have been some suggestions that um, if they still have a little bit from the second brood, they'll go in and make a third brood. Now they're sucking fumes. But they'll do what they can. By this time, you know, now we're into late spring. This brood here probably won't even make it to the winter. They've started too late. They're not going to develop right through until the winter. So this, this is usually looked at as a bit of a throwaway brood. Um, if they make it, great, but they probably won't. Um, studies done in Alaska and Newfoundland have always found that uh, as these broods here, these are sibling broods, develop through the summer, um, once they're done, they simply come out of the tree, walk to the base, and burrow in, if they bother coming out of the tree at all. Again, they don't have flight muscles. They basically come out, I'm looking at the sun in the sky, looks like winter's coming, I'm going to get ready for winter, even if it's the end of July, beginning of August. They're just looking for a place to spend the winter. No observed reproduction. And that suggests what we in entomology would call a, an obligate reproductive, reproductive diapause or required reproductive diapause. This is basically suggesting that there must be something about these, because they don't have flight muscles yet or anything, that they have to go through a chilling period. They have to go through the winter in order to become reproductively mature. So these insects are not going to be capable of reproducing unless they go through the winter. There is this required reproductive diapause over wintering period in the adult stage. And several studies have looked at this and said, yeah, this makes a lot of sense from everything that we've seen in the field and in the lab. So the first experiment that Fraser did when he came on for a PhD was just said, okay, well, let's make sure that the adults have a required reproductive diapause. And Let's just get familiar with the insect in general. Anytime you start with a new system, you want to make sure that you can work with the insects. Um, 
you know, do they colonize the material okay if we bring them into the lab? Do we have a way of getting them out of the logs in one piece? Um, will they behave? Um, so we did an experiment. And we took some tamarack trees partway through the summer that had been um, infested with beetles. So we're expecting now by the end of the summer these beetles should come out. We brought these infested tamaracks to the lab. And sure enough, some of the insects came out right away. These are young emergent adult beetles. Uh, we had some non-emerging young adult beetles that we just we stripped the bark, picked them out of the pupil chambers. Um, and then without letting them go through the winter, room temperature in the lab, we simply inserted them into fresh bolts of tamarack. And they took, they would burrow in. Um, and uh, either the ones that we pulled out sleeping or the ones that came out looking for a place to walk. Um, and uh, we, we infest them and then we put them into these rearing tubes. And these are high, highly technical uh, sona tubes basically from Menards. Uh, put the log in, put a little lid over it with an emergence jars. These insects like to come to the light. And so any offspring that emerge, they'll walk right into these jars and we can count them and we can look at them. And from this experiment, I mean, I'll ask you here in this room, I mean, what would we expect if these insects need an overwintering chilling period? Um, what do we expect from this experiment? If you're online, I'm just getting a lot of people shaking their heads here that nothing should happen. Um, this is the ultimate PhD experiment because we expect it to take four years. Um, we expect to set these things up, no winter in the lab, and nothing should happen. You know, we can wait one, two, three, four years, and Fraser can check on these every day, and we're going to see nothing because they haven't been through the winter. Um, instead, my, my first thought that something funny was happening was when Fraser was starting to collect these insects as they came out of these infested trees. Now, again, this is in late summer. And one day I was walking by a rearing room and I heard, hey, get back here. And I stepped back and I said, yes. And he said, no, not you, the beetles, they're flying. And I said, what do you mean they're flying? They can't fly. Dave Langer has done this work. They don't have flight muscles. And we have a flight mill in our lab and we took some of these insects and we put them on the flight mill. And Eric and Nystrom discovered that they will fly for hours. We were like, whoa, this is not supposed to happen. Um, much to our surprise, uh, we found that, especially the ones that came out on their own, um, putatively ready to go into you know, this walking journey to the base of the tree to overwinter, we found that actually they're reproduce, reproducing quite well. We had between 40 and 50 offspring coming out from each female. Even the ones that we pulled out who were you know, apparently asleep, not quite ready for the winter, um, even they were squeezing out five to ten beetles. And we were starting to wonder, like, hmm, something different is happening here. Maybe not all insects have this required overwintering period. So, again, this is, this is what we thought was happening. Females just jump tree to tree to tree, create these three sibling broods. Um, their vitality, you know, begins to decrease pretty quickly after coming out of a tree. There's this required reproductive diapause. Any progeny that come from these basically just hang out in the duff and don't do anything until the following spring. Instead, our lab experiment suggested that maybe this reproductive diapause, this chilling requirement, is only optional. Maybe we have this split population. Some insects need to go through the winter, but maybe some don't. Maybe it's not a hard and fast rule. Maybe we have the split population. And maybe this third brood here that we always thought were the females that were just completely done. Okay, I'm going to lay this last third group of trees. Maybe this is actually the second generation that's coming from this first brood. If the insects come out early enough, in May, and lay this first group here, if they emerge early enough, mid-summer, maybe they have enough time to actually attack trees, and they're not going into wintering mode. 
So we asked the, the question, you know, without this required adult overwintering period, could we actually see eastern large beetles reproducing two times per year? Um, this is known as biboltonism as opposed to uniboltonism, one time per year under natural field conditions. And when we really scrutinize some of the older field notes from Swain, he had in one of his notes um, in a completely separate field report, the suggestion, he said, yes, I was, I was tracking this bunch of slash that was infested with eastern larch beetles, and much to my surprise, in July, there was another set of slash next to it, adjacent, that got attacked. I do not know the origin of these beetles. And he was thinking that the origin, you know, it must be beetles that just were really slow to come out that spring. They just didn't get the memo that spring is here. Maybe it's July. And it got us thinking, like, oh, maybe Swain actually saw bivolcanism too. And maybe that was first generation that was turning into a second generation. So what Fraser did was uh, followed 150 trees scattered in northern Minnesota over three years and sample the weekly subset for the spring emergence of parent beetles. So we can put these window traps on the trees, uh, and we can capture these beetles that are just under the bark spending the winter, or the ones that have walked down the bowl to tunnel in, uh, either the duff or just right down here. And we can see the adults that come into these traps. You can see exactly what the spring emergence is. Then we can cruise through these stands on a weekly basis, and Fraser would do this starting in March and continue this right up until November. And he would look at all the trees. He was actually following more than 150 trees. Um, we just followed 150 really intensively, but we could see these periods of beetle attack. And we could see when the adults came out in the spring, when a cohort of trees was attacked. Things would kind of die down then as the trees would fill up with beetles. They were busy laying their eggs. And then after a quiet period, a couple weeks later, we'd see another wave of attack. And those, as expected, would be the females that were emerging from the trees, dumping those last eggs. And then sometimes we'd even see, you know, like, hey, if we're lucky, we'll see a third period. Uh, Reemergence of parents, as I mentioned. Uh, once the trees are attacked, we could put these cages up on the trees, watch as the parents would come out. Fraser would take bark squares off the trees every week. And he could follow, like, okay, this week we have eggs. Next week we have larvae. And we could see the developmental stages progress through the spring and summer. And you do this for three, four, five, six weeks in a row. Eventually you see the adults would start to come out. And these are the young progeny. And these are the ones that up till now we always thought would climb down the tree and get ready to overwinter. So... I'm going to share with you three different lines of evidence that suggest that we have two generations per year um, of eastern large beetle here in Minnesota. I'm going to talk about seasonal phenology observations, observations from beetle coloration, and finally talk about the fat content, the lipid content of emerging parent beetles. Um, and this is what makes us think something has changed and we actually have some unique situations occurring here in Minnesota. So first of all, observations from seasonal phenology, we would see total new attacks every week, and this is 2012 data that we've graphed here. Um, and we would look at trees being attacked, and you can see here through the beginning of part of April, Fraser could walk through this entire stand and not see any trees attacked. And then we see a large peak when it warms up enough, and the trees are attacked, dies down, now we see the second smaller peak graphed here in red. Um, again, very, very small compared to the first peak. These are just some of the females that are dumping the remainder of the eggs. And then a few weeks later, after a quiet period, you may see this little prolonged bump. Um, and we see this third cohort of trees get attacked. So three discrete periods. Um, and this would change, but look somewhat similar every year. This pink bar here corresponds to the second cohort of trees right here. Um, so these are when that second cohort is attacked. And on the bottom graph here, we've graphed the re-emerging parents. And you can see here that the second set of trees getting attacked corresponds really well 
with parents in black here emerging from the first set of trees. So new trees being attacked. At the same time, the parents were coming into cages from that first cohort in the spring. And then we would see the second cohort of parents, they would start to come out a few weeks later. And we could start to look at, okay, this third group of trees here, grafted in kind of this aqua color here, we can see if that overlaps with the second group of parents coming out. And just from eyeballing it, it didn't look like it fit very well. It looked like that second group of parents were coming out beginning part of July, and we weren't seeing really strong attack on that next set of trees until one or two weeks later. Fraser changed some of the graphs and he looked at emerging adults from this first group. So these are the progeny from this first set of trees here that were attacked. Eastern larch beetles can develop through in about 700 degree days. Um, we get to the beginning part of July and we saw that, you know what, when those beetles are coming out of the trees, the progeny, that's exactly when we're seeing these new trees being attacked. So I thought, well, okay, maybe they're just being attacked. Um, because they're attacking new trees and looking for a place to overwinter or something. But as we continued to sample these trees, we saw that, no, they were actually developing from eggs into larvae, um, quite reproductively mature. The second line of evidence that we looked at was beetle coloration. And beetles will darken with age from tan to black. Um, spring emergent parents are black-bodied. Um, summer and fall, when they come out to cumulatively overwinter, they're usually dark brown to black. They kind of start off as a red, and they'll darken over time, a period of a few days, and they'll turn from that light red to kind of a chestnut brown to a black. And we also had some flight traps set up in the stand, and we we're looking at the flight periods, and... Uh, this bottom line here, this is what we caught on July the 6th, 2012. Lots and lots of black beetles. These were somewhat old. A week later, the color of the beetles in the funnel traps changed to this chestnut brown, suggesting that they were actually quite young. And we were shocked because beetles like this are not supposed to be able to fly. Um, there are lots of studies that show that the flight muscles are resorbed. Um, that didn't make any sense at all. We were like, you know what, um, we're seeing these beetles leaving the trees, we're seeing other trees being attacked, and we know now that the young beetles are flying around, likely getting ready to attack new trees. There are lots of bark beetles that actually have to fly for a short period of time to become physiologically ready to attack trees. We thought to ourselves, well, you know, maybe this is just a color morph in the population. Maybe some of the beetles are red, some are black. Maybe we haven't noticed this before. But Fraser was taking the bark off a subsection of these trees every week and looking at the content underneath the bark. And he found that the number of reddish-brown, putatively young beetles would decline through time. And if this was a color morph, we would expect that it should be about constant. And instead, we found that all the beetles turned black within three, four, or five weeks. So that suggested to us that this was not a color morph. It was likely a new generation of beetles that were attacking these trees. Finally, one of the techniques that you can use to sometimes get an idea of the age of an insect or what it's been up to is looking at the lipid content or the fat content. Um, these are re-emerging, this is the fat content of re-emerging female beetles that we're capturing out of the tree. So this is the first set of trees that are attacked in the spring. When female beetles lay eggs, they use fat content. Lipid content is what fuels egg production. And if, if you look at these studies in other insects, you see that, yeah, before they go into a tree, pretty healthy, nice and fat, um, lay some eggs, fat content starts to decrease. Um, and we said to ourselves, we can do these analyses, we can catch these beetles, and if it is the females that are simply going from tree to tree to tree, dumping eggs, by the time they get to that third cohort, they should be toast. They're going to be gassed. There's going to be nothing left. Um, 
very, very low lipid content left as they've spent all their fat on laying eggs in previous trees. Instead, this is what we found. And we were shocked to find that beetles in the third set of trees, these parents, had higher lipid content than the ones that were coming out first thing in the spring. These are lean, mean egg-laying machines. These females are ready. And we said to ourselves, well, why, why do they have so much fat? And beetles also use up lipids going through the winter. These insects here haven't had the privilege of going through the winter. So they have all that fat and more. Unlike the ones from the first brood, they've lost, you know, 5% of their body weight because they've already gone through a winter. No, by the time you get into early July, that second brood, they're ready to attack trees. So we put all this together, and we said, you know what? It looks like Minnesota has two generations of eastern larch beetles. And this has not been noted anywhere that we know of um, other than kind of along the southern margin of the range. And we know now the exact number of degree days that it takes for a generation of beetles. Um, you can get bimoltonism with as little as about 1,402 degree days using a 41 Fahrenheit, 5 degrees Celsius base. Um, that's the earliest possible. If you look at, you know, a substantial part of the population, we think the line is somewhere around 2,000. And we're currently doing some work on some temperature modeling, trying to, to optimize this, figure out exactly where it is, and what might have kicked off that outbreak. But we can see here, 2,000 and on, we can see degree day accumulation just in Grand Rapids is on a slowly inclining trend. And this is like, likely what partially explains um, the current outbreak that we have in the state. We're just seeing more and more beetles from two generations of beetles rather than one generation of beetles. And as you slide that scalar in the population, especially thinking about how that second generation is so much more able to attack trees and lay eggs with a higher lipid content, it spells a lot of trouble for tamarack. Um, we have been looking um, at where we're seeing the most tamarack activity. And okay, I don't have that map in there. We've been looking at where we see the most tamarack being killed from eastern large field. And we're seeing it primarily along the southwestern margin of the range of tamarack. All the way from Alberta, Canada, right through the east coast. And it looks like many of those areas where we're seeing that correspond really well to about an 1,800 to 2,000 degree, degree day threshold. And it looks like eastern large beetle, as things are warming, are chasing the range of tamarack farther north. And that's why we have this outbreak that just keeps continuing and continuing. Um, I just looked today for uh, Grand Rapids, and I see the Albers are here. And eastern large beetle is out as of Sunday attacking trees, which is quite early. And it suggests that you know, in, in areas of the states uh, where we have tamarack left, um, again, this is, this is a year where I could definitely see two generations occurring. Um, down here in uh, the Twin Cities metro area, we're right at about 250 degree days. So they're already partially through a first brood. Um, it's incredible how fast these things are developing. So concluding thoughts, um, extended growing seasons seem to allow a second generation of beetles to develop. Um, this second generation, instead of just heading to the base of the tree to overwinter, turn around and attack the trees in mid to late summer. And that's when tamaracks are not used to being attacked. Evolutionarily, they are used to being attacked early in the spring. And there's a lot of thought about spring infesting bark beetles like spruce beetle and eastern larch beetle likely have evolved to attack trees first thing in the spring because they're trying to get into them when the roots are frozen before the tree can mount much of a defensive response. Um, tamarack are not used to seeing beetles attack them in the middle of the summer. Um, what's kind of interesting too is that uh, all these broods that develop, even though the first brood might get done in June, the second one in July, the third one in August or September, 
The ones that do decide not to attack new trees but just go to the base to overwinter simply come out all at the same time the next spring. That There's kind of like a winter reset, and you just get that many more beetles that come out at the same time to attack trees in the spring. Um, finally, uh, some of the cold temperature studies that Rob Bennett and Abby Walters had done a few years ago found that eastern ice beetles are extremely cold hardy. And you would expect this because we find the insect all the way up to Alaska. Um, and the ones that don't get through to, uh, to maturity in the winter typically don't die off. Um, they just pick right up in the summer and can join like a second brood or something like that. So a little bit surprising. Um, yes, uh, as I mentioned, you know, we're, we're thinking now, like, maybe we're going to see eastern large beetle just push the range of tamarack right up. If you look at the mortality that's occurring in this region here, there's a significant outbreak occurring in the Rocky Mountains here in Alberta, um, in Quebec, uh, maritime. So kind of interesting to see, you know, is this extended development and extended growing seasons responsible for some of this? Um, Climate change is a multifaceted um, topic. We don't think it's strictly length of the growing season. Um, there does seem to be uh, a significant effect of drought stress, especially around 2000, 2005, and 6. Uh, we're working with some climatologists now looking at, did that help get eastern large beetle activity kicked off? Um, and as I mentioned, we're looking at some other uh, interesting large herbivores like large case bear. I'm trying to figure out why is that all of a sudden so abundant again when it had disappeared for years. Um, so lots of things to study with Tamarack. Um, if you want to read some of the more scientific publications, um, I've kind of skimmed off the top of some of this, but we have started to rewrite some of the textbook on Eastern Large Beetle. Um, there's some really interesting temperature relationships with development with this insect and what temperatures it does best at. Um, so contact me if you'd like to read these. Uh, I can send them to you. I'm happy to do so. I'd like to acknowledge our collaborators from the DNR, many of whom are in this room today, uh, Forest Service, uh, and especially the Evaluation Monitoring Program for funding. Um, and I will stop there and uh, take some questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. We have a, a couple questions from online. Um, so what are you noticing in terms of which tree species are coming in under the dead tamarack? Yeah, that's a great question. So what comes next? And I'm actually going to punt that to <laughs> uh, with Marcel at Windmuller Campioni is, is here in the audience as a silviculturalist. And that's you know, the great question, like, what happens next? Is it just a bunch of tag alder and brush or you know, Brian Schwengel? Um, that's a good question. I think, <laughs> I think the jury's still out on what comes next. So uh, hopefully, um, hopefully that will come with a future project. Yeah, something that needs some more study. I, I wish I had some you know, answers of, you know, we've studied some of these stands for four or five years. Now we're done, we're out of them. Um, but what's going to happen to them? I don't know. I don't know. That needs some work. And, and we can make some materials available in an email as a follow-up to the webinar. I know the DNR has done a Tamarack assessment report. Mm -hmm. I might show some insight into that as well. So we can make that link available to folks. Um, are there questions from here in St. Paul for Brian? So, <clears throat> talk about Manette and Walter's analysis of overwintering larvae. So, would, would those larvae, when they fully develop and the adults emerge legs the next year, their offspring, are they considered, or would they be considered a second generation or more like an overlapping generation. It seems like it would get really complicated. Is there any way to, to differentiate that? Or are there any implications for like population growth? Or, like, yeah, we, we used to think that, that, you know, the ones that wouldn't make it 
to full adulthood will just kind of die off. But what we're seeing is they will complete development. So that's fractional volatilism. And that's kind of halfway. Um, so they complete their development the following spring then and emerge. Now, before, if there's just a few of those coming out, you know, they may be joined that third cohort of trees being attacked. And if it's just the females who are completely gassed in attacking trees, we don't have enough numbers to kill any tamarack. You know, they, they mount an attack and die off. That's about it. Now, if we do have part of the second generation and the ones that are reproducing and overwintering and catching up in the spring, add those and you have that many more beetles. So Fraser is uh, just completing some work now looking at trying to put some numbers on what the actual contribution of these full generations and partial generations are. And uh, they're far and above beyond the 8% for that last brood that we thought to population dynamics. Yeah, good question. Another question from online. Do you see any differences between upwind and lowland larch in terms of resistance to the larch beetle? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, are there any differences between upland and lowland larch? Um, most of our work was done in lowland sites, um, but from what we've seen, no, not a lot of difference. Um, and, you know, I think it could be, you know, some extraneous factors like, uh, like drought stress and things like that that are also stressing the upland tamaracks. Um, but again, a lot of it, I think, goes back to if it's a mature tamarack and it's susceptible to a beetle, you get this wave of beetles come through in late summer when tamarack are not used to being attacked by beetles. That's um, not a good thing. I would just add that when we were working at it, we really didn't think we saw any difference between upland and lowland. And we also didn't think we saw really any significant difference between your stands and the next stand. So the next stand got hit as well as hard as the pure stands. But I don't know if Frazier found anything on that. Or no, we, we found that they were about the same. Pure stands, mixed stands, everything would get hit pretty hard. Um, we thought maybe the pure stands um, especially some of the really dense ones would, would be just a little bit cooler with enough shading from some of those tamarack and some of those high density sites. And no, they would, they would lose those fine needles and twigs pretty quickly. And uh, temperature profiles were pretty much similar across stand densities and uh, rates of development were really similar too. Other questions from folks here? For your managers, could you talk about like minimum um, susceptible diameter to attack that you've seen? Maybe I've seen two inch diameter trees attacking so far. But when you look in a stand, you see they move. It looks like they move faster. You see the larger the stuff is, the faster they move. And if it grades a stand grades into like on the original bowl or two wedge or whatever. As it starts to get into about a four inch diameter, it really starts to slow down. Probably has to do with long thickness, part thickness, or just. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's what we saw. They preferentially go for the larger diameter stuff. Once that's filled, then they just kind of move backwards and they'll go right down to two inches. Other questions for Brian? If not, then thank you, Brian, for your help today and talking to us about Eastern Lunch Beetle.